It's a floating fortress of military might with one purpose in mind. Sound of freedom there. Total air superiority. We can pump out some serious airplanes in just a matter of minutes. It's the largest warship in the world. And the flight deck is four and a half acres of sovereign U.S. territory that we can park off anybody's coast anywhere without anybody's permission whenever the president says go. The aircraft carrier USS Harry S. Truman. The aircraft mix includes self-defense aircraft, attack aircraft, rescue aircraft, refueling aircraft. So we're our own little unit, totally isolated. Anywhere we need to be, we can be there in a matter of hours. Armed with more than 80 aircraft, standing 20 stories above the waterline, 97,000 tons of sea-splitting ship that's 30,000 tons more than the Titanic weighed. Its anchor chain alone is the largest in the U.S. Navy. Each one of these links you're looking at weighed 365 pounds. Altogether, there's over a third of a mile of chain, adding up to a half a million pounds of dead weight. A complete military base roaming the open seas. She even has her own zip code and nuclear reactors producing energy that's electrifying. It's got uh, two nuclear reactors that generate around 1,100 million watts of power. That's enough power for over a quarter of a million homes. Building something of such magnitude was an undertaking of unprecedented proportions. The Newport News shipyard outside of Norfolk, Virginia, began construction on the Truman back in 1989. Over the course of five years, workers put over a million pounds of aluminum into her structure, plus 60,000 tons of steel, enough to lay 250 miles of railroad track. In 1998, the Navy commissioned the Truman, and all the hard work paid off, especially for those who were there in the early days. I uh, helped build it. I came from the shipyard with her. Uh, I went through the catapult testing, went through all the uh, long hours and everything, and now we're finally here out to sea doing what, uh, what I get paid to do, and that's to launch airplanes. And they launched some serious planes off an extremely limited space with the help of one very powerful mechanism. It's a steam engine catapult. When the plane is fastened in, and its jets are revved up to full power. The catapult gives it the boost it needs to hit air before hitting water. The catapult itself is about 309 feet in length, and I could take a 50,000 pound airplane and launch them in uh, about 2.2 seconds. In that brief instant, from zero to 160 miles per hour, planes become airborne. From the bubble, people known as shooters can trigger a launch every 10 to 15 seconds. Now you start utilizing all four catapults, we can shoot anywhere from 30 to 40 airplanes in a matter of minutes. And while jets are shooting off one end, they're touching down at the other. It's called trapping, and it's dicey. As big as this aircraft carrier is, almost 1,100 feet, when you come in to land an F-18 at 150 miles an hour, you actually have to put it down in an area less than 150 feet wide and long. Flying onto this tiny runway is like threading a needle. Uh, by the time you touch down, there's actually a, a, a piece of sky 10 feet by 10 feet wide that you're trying to put the airplane through. So uh, it's real big as you're walking around here on the flight deck, but when you're looking up at about 20,000 feet, it looks about the size of a poaching stamp. It's pretty darn small. The small landing site is lined with four cables, each an inch and a half thick. As the plane comes in, it has four opportunities to grab on. Planes descend at speeds of 115 miles an hour. If they miss all four cables, they've got to be moving fast enough to take off. But when it catches, it's one hell of a stop. 
So you're gonna go approximately from about 140 knots to zero in about 200 feet. It takes a lot of resistance to absorb that much force. Here's how it works. The cable is connected to a giant hydraulic piston below deck. When a plane hooks on, the piston underneath the landing area absorbs the shock, and the plane stops. I want 610 on spot three so I can get him broke down and put him in a hole. And uh, the other two uh, will fuel him in a four and five. Yes, sir. Using a scaled down model of the deck as his stage, the handling officer keeps his thumb on the pulse of all activity. I'll know who's getting ready to launch on the catapults. I know who's getting ready to recover. And I use this to make the airplane work. And that's my primary job is to make this airplane work. And like a three-dimensional chess game, another flurry of activity is going on beneath the flight deck. Hundreds of workers populate the immense hangar bay, doing repairs, maintenance, and testing around the clock. In the event of a storm, every plane must be moved off the deck and out of harm's way. This gigantic repair and storage facility can house more than 80 aircraft at once. Gigantic doors can be drawn in the hangar bay, sectioning it off into three separate facilities. That way, if there's flooding or fire, the problem area can be isolated and the planes in the other sections can remain protected. In order to keep track of what looks like chaos to the untrained eye, there's one important prerequisite. You'd better not be colorblind. We have blue shirts who are talk and chain handlers. We have purple shirts who are the fuelers. We have yellow shirts who are the directors. We have uh, red shirts who are crash and salvage and ordnance personnel. A flight deck is one of the most dangerous places in the world to work. So all the top cats don't need gas, guys, so you make sure you get, get your crews ready to go. By knowing who's doing what, the men on board can tick through their routines with the precision and timing of a Swiss watch. A lot of it's invisible, it's hand movements. When you watch people on the flight deck, it's like a choreographed ballet. An airplane will trap, the hook will come up, he'll be turning off, they'll be guiding him down to refuel on one end. We're guiding another guy in the back. Hordes of people from all walks of life. Up to 6,000 of them populate her maze of halls, and they have a lot of needs. Chief Supply Officer Bob Howard knows those needs down to the detergent. When the air wing comes aboard, we probably go up to about maybe 5,000, 5,500 pounds of laundry per day. We use about 40 pounds of soap a day to wash all those clothes. Keeping the crew clean is one thing, but keeping them well-fed is paramount. This crew likes chocolate chip cookies. We make over 6,000 chocolate chip cookies every day. Make about 200 dozen donuts for breakfast. I can put any Dunkin' Donut out of business with the machine and the capability we have. The ship's fresh water production facility pumps out 400,000 gallons of drinking water per day, enough for 2,000 homes. Toilet paper for interest, we carry over 7,000 rolls of toilet paper. Maybe we use 100, 150 rolls per day. It depends on how the crew's doing. Complete with two nuclear reactors, this 1,100-foot self-contained mobile air and sea unit is capable of cruising the ocean for 20 straight years. Just because this boat is longer than the London Bridge doesn't mean it can't maneuver. The ship can go from her maximum ahead speed in excess of 30 knots to a dead stop in the water in under six ship's lengths, which compares really well to your car. She can also turn 180 degrees and be going in the other direction in 12 to 1500 yards which is about three ship's lengths, which again is very, very quick. She could turn a little faster, but because I have an airport on top of the ship, I have to keep her within two degrees level so the airplanes don't bump around into one another or taxi off the side. From the bridge deck, officers get a bird's eye view of ship activity, but that's not the only view available. Cutting edge navigational tools like GPS radar and computer layouts of the ocean provide the